All right, Brad, you're good to go. Looking forward to hearing it. All right. Thank you all. Thank you all very much for joining me at the end of a long day. This is my fifth time, fifth, fifth session that I've taught today. So I've been right there with you, except I've been doing this type of stuff during the day. Um, so uh, dealing with online critics, um, just to give you a little for those who don't know me, just my 30 second. Who the heck am I? Uh, uh, this is about my 44th year in communications in one form or another. Uh, I spent a decade as a newspaper, radio, and television reporter. Uh, then I worked in state government communications for 10 years. And then I worked with the Kentucky School Boards Association for 24 years, uh, directed their communications efforts. And that's where I launched their social media platforms. And uh, the last several years, I've been doing more and more training about social media because one of my goals in life is to encourage more people such as yourselves to get engaged in social media. The problem is that we have gone from social media days of being a, a tool for interaction, a tool for exchanges. We've gone to, if you'll permit me, to the dark side. Uh, and the pandemic has played a big role in this. Uh, uh, people have had time on their hands, they've been stuck at home, they're on their computers, they're on their phones, and the people who were critics have just been inflamed by this, and, and sadly, many of them feel empowered by this, and uh, the negativity that is on social media uh, has, has grown, I, I have no scientific studies, just my observations, it's grown exponentially. So the Kentucky School Public Relations Association asked me to create a class for them uh, on dealing with online critics. And we, because we're in the KDE speed dating for information uh, session today at EdCamp, I've uh, kind of pared it down, but I hope to share with you some ideas about not always dealing with, but deciding on where to deal with and then how to effectively deal with social media critics and also with people who are doing it electronically via emails. And I'll get into that a little bit later on. So my experience is that there are what I'm going to call three different kinds of online critics that you as principals and other educators are going to have to deal with. You may not think about this one, but my very first one is what I call the faithful followers. These are basically people that are supportive of you and what you're doing. They're supportive of your school. They may be engaged in your school. But something comes up that makes them question or something comes up that they're opposed and now they have become a critic on that issue and they're raising questions and if they don't get answers, I don't necessarily mean answers they like, but if they don't get answers, they may uh, lose that faithful follower status. I'm a fervent believer in there are three types of people that are engaged uh, with us in life. There's people that who, who know us, who know us. There's people that are for us. There are people that are against us. And there are people sitting on the fence about us. There are things that we can do to move those fence sitters to our side. There are also things that if we don't do, some of those people who are on our side will move to the fence. And some fence sitters may go on the other direction. But the faithful followers can't just be taken for granted because uh, we, can, we can lose the support that way if we're not uh, responding to them. Then there's what I call the passion providers. These are people that approach everything passionately. I mean, I mean, if they were painting a house, they'd be going at it all crazy like this. Like this. Uh, they're not always negative, but when they do get engaged, when they do start trying to ask questions or make points, they're going to do it with passion, and uh, they will push back against when they see somebody who is trying to, uh, I won't say undermine, but who's not giving the consideration they feel they're due because of the passion they have for that particular point. But then there's group number three. This is what I call the glass gargoyles because I fervently believe there are people who get up every day, fill a mug with glass, gargle it, and then go out and look for people to attack. And unfortunately, social media and the pandemic have raised the profile of many of these people who are out there who, who do nothing but attack. An interesting thing is that unless they are uh, a more, more of a professional approach because they're promoting something that's uh, different from public education or something of that nature, a lot of these folks, when, they, when an attack doesn't get any traction, they may go away. And so that's why that I would like you to consider this reality about social media critics. And this also applies to critics on, on uh, email as well. 
Some of them you're going to have to live with. Some of them sometimes you need to ignore. And some of them you got to stand up to. Uh, when I do training with regard to working with the mainstream news media, uh, there's an old bromide that you can't fight the person who buys the ink by the barrel. And I think that's a lie. There are times when you have to go up against the people who buy the ink by the barrel, just as there are times when you have to stand up to the people who have activity on social media, who are active via email out there. But you don't have to do it all the time. And that becomes part of the decision making process. There are some of them, like I said, those faithful followers out there, you got to live with them and engaging them, even when they're critical is important. There are some of those folks, maybe these are some of the passion people who uh, you may be able to ignore. Maybe what they are saying uh, is something that doesn't require response. But then there are people out there who are sowing disinformation, who are just simply trying to make you or your school look bad. And I'm not saying that you respond every time. I am saying that there are going to be times when you're going to have to figure out how to respond. And that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of the class. A number of options on social media for how you're going to deal with critics may already be locked in by how the social media platform was set up, whether it's open or whether it's closed. And it's very important as a principle for you to understand how your platform works. Uh, a closed platform uh, is just for pushing out information. Uh, there's no criticism there uh, because there's no engagement going on. Okay. There may be criticism elsewhere on other social media platforms, but not there. When I launched the Facebook and Twitter pages for the Kentucky School Boards Association, I didn't want to be the Facebook cop. And so those were closed platforms. And we just pushed information out. Over the years, though, I've come to understand better about the engagement aspect, and especially for school leaders, about being able to get feedback, being able to have uh, give and go back and forth, uh, that a, an open platform comes up. Uh, you, you can change your platform. It's not easy to do, and it's something your IT folks would have to do for you, but an open platform allows you to get information out, but allows you to get feedback. It does, though, open up possibility or crit or possibility, the reality of criticism on your site. There's no dialogue on a closed platform. There's the potential for dialogue. Sometimes you have to initiate it. There's a way to go out and get feedback from people and input from people via social media, but you may have to in, you may have to uh, initiate it yourself. But that does require monitoring. And I say regular monitoring. And if you have an open source platform on Facebook or Twitter, uh, especially if you're engaged in some issue that's controversial, you're going to want to do some monitoring on there. And you have to decide then what to do about your critics. I'll give you some tools later on that will help you totally shut down your critics. I don't advocate using them except in extreme circumstances, but I want you to know about them. But you've got to monitor because people using your platform to spread misinformation are going to, one, harm your school's reputation, your, your reputation, uh, but they're also going to sometimes have people see it on your platform and assume that it's, if not posted by you, that it is endorsed by you. So if you're going to have an open source platform, you're going to have to spend some time, maybe once a day. It's not something you have to check it's multiple times a day or hourly, but you can't let a week go by, especially if there's some controversy going on. So here's my five steps for responding and deciding about responding to social media critics. Number one, if you hear about something on social media and someone's saying you need to respond, check it out yourself. Never depend on what somebody else says, so-and-so posted. I don't care if they send you a screenshot, go ahead and look at it yourself. It is essential for you to be able to see exactly how it was posted, exactly how it was worded before you decide whether or not you want to respond. Don't take someone else's, even your best friend's word for it. Go take a look at it. Wait and see. Wait and see the impact of what's up there. And I don't mean wait for a day or wait for a week or anything like that, but wait and see. 
the critical question here in dealing with, and I would say this is in critics on, on any aspect, whether it's uh, in an email chain, whether it's social media, whether it's on the web, does it have legs? I have been preaching this idea of seeing if it has legs to people for years because there is just a lot of stuff that people post that goes nowhere at all and it dies of its own weight and the critic sees it has nothing and they don't beat the drum again. They just go on to criticize somebody else. Wait and see if it has legs. If there's buzz in the building, if people are telling you that they saw it, if they're talking about it at the checkout line at Walmart, okay, it's got legs. And then you have to decide about whether you're going to deal with it or not. But give it some time to see if it has legs and then plan on how you're going to respond going forward. If you decide that you're going to respond, pick your battlefield. Pick where you're going to be doing it and you don't do it on somebody else's platform. Never engage somebody else. I hate to use the phrase war of words, but never engage someone else in a he said, she said back and forth on their platform. First of all, the people that are following those folks are their friends and they're not going to be predisposed to like what it is that you have to say. Take them to your platform. Post something like to see the other side of this and then give the platform and then take them to your platform to see what it is that you have to say. On your platform, don't regurgitate the complaint or the criticism out there. Just say something like, there's been an issue raised about our, uh, our, our, about our cafeteria service. There's been an issue raised about how we're handling ACT tests. There's been an issue raised about why the bus line has been modified there. And then give them a full response. Tell them the reasons. Tell them, tell them the whys and the wherefores. As much as you can, be affirmative, not defensive. Don't explain why things are bad and why you're doing something differently. Explain why this is going to benefit the kids in the classroom. This is going to benefit the kids around the school. This is going to be why it's going to benefit teaching and learning in the school. There is a difference in being on the defensive and being, I don't use offensive, I use affirmative here. Okay. So try to make it as positive as you can in explaining why you're doing something, why you are being required to do something, if it's by district fiat or something that the state is doing. Use facts and data whenever you can, but please, please, anything that you're gonna use, make it as indisputable as possible. If you are dealing with critics out there and you post something and they can find a way, some of them are gonna find a way to challenge it anyway, but if you post something out there and it turns out that it's not true, uh, the critics are going to jump all over that and it's going to diminish the credibility of your message. S source the information. Uh, uh, name that this is, comes from the Kentucky Department of Education or this comes from the Kentucky Public Health Department of Public Health or this comes from the CDC or the Kentucky High School Athletic Association. Uh, link to other uh, uh, resources that they have online that are explaining the reasoning for it. You know, you don't have to take all the heat for all the decisions you get criticized for if it comes from higher up your district food chain or in some other agency out there. So lay it out there for other people to see. This last one is here, crucial. Never engage on your platform naming the critic that you're responding to. There is nothing that will take some of these match heads out there and strike a light to them and pour gasoline on them than having themselves called out on your page. Somebody raised the issue, there's some questions raised, blah, 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 something like that, but don't go out and put that other person out there because even if they don't see it, it's gonna be your dumb luck that somebody else is gonna tell them and then all of a sudden they're on your site trying to engage in a war of words with you on the site there. Make your information, but pick the battlefield. Do it on your page where you're sharing the correct information. That doesn't mean that you're not going to have some engagement, some debate, some back and forth. But the other th reason is because you've got so many other great stories to tell on your platform. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. There are some things that you can do via social media to, for your site, shut down a long-term fight with critics. I strongly urge you to consider carefully before doing any of these things. Like I said, 
uh, on, on my Twitter account. There's probably out of 3,600 people that are following and many more that engage on that site every day, I could probably, this many people that I have blocked, and it's for two reasons. One, using profanity on my site, or two, totally taking information that I provided and making a lie out of it and posting it on my site or posting it elsewhere like that. Those are no question blocks. I have muted conversations many times because the conversation doesn't serve any purpose and someone's just simply trying to stir things up. You can snooze on Facebook and you can come back to them later on. You can unfriend, uh, blocking. I just encourage you to do it as a last resort. Even if this person is a frequent critic, you may learn something from, if nothing else, if you know that there is a controversy boiling because someone is raising it, if you had blocked them, you might not even know that controversy was going on and you could be strengthened by having that information uh, because you hadn't blocked them. But these are things that can be done out there uh, if it becomes absolutely necessary. Uh, I just strongly encourage you to be very, very careful in thinking about doing that. Step five is you flood your social media accounts with good news. And I'm going to show you some examples that I found in, in less than five minutes of looking on social media today from school leaders like yourselves out there. Because when you are taking critics to your site, you know, there's a thing about, there's a thing about people that are always being critical. Don't you have some suspicions about why all they have to be is negative? Um, I do. And I, I know when I used to be a reporter and there was a city councilman who never spoke up except to criticize the city administration. And, and after a while, you begin to doubt uh, not only the reasoning for that, but the veracity of what they're saying out there. When you bring them people to your site, not just critics, but when you bring people to your site, you want them to see the positives that are going on, the things that you would like them to know about your school. Even when you're taking controversial items to your social media site, by letting them see the other things out there, they'll see, you know, they're saying this is a bad school. It's not a bad school because look at all these other things that are going on out there. These are things I found in five minutes today. Here is, I believe this was a principal who uh, is doing, does staff shout outs uh, on, on his, uh, uh, his uh, Facebook or Twitter page, I forget right now. But uh, you can do this type of thing. It doesn't take a great amount of time to do. Uh, it's uh, uh, reaffirming and affirming to your staff out there. Other people will see it. Um, here's a little thing right here. Uh, uh, school system that purchased some goats. Uh, you know, some people like goats. It's kind of a cute thing, I thought. And, and they're celebrating what's going on with the ag program at the school. Uh, this particular uh, early childhood center in Shelby County Schools, they went bananas today. They must have had 20 posts on there today. And, but they had all these cute pictures of kids. Uh, nobody doesn't like cute kids. If you can populate your site with cute kids, especially if you have a, an Instagram account, which is basically photographs. Uh, I have been encouraging superintendents for years, every time they go into a school to get out the camera, take group pictures and post them on there, especially selfies of them with the kids and post them on there because it is the celebration of the learning and the activity going on in schools. And you can do those things and you can retweet one of these things or share this on your Facebook page out there. Here's another one, another staff award that goes on up there. This was kind of cute because uh, they got remarks from students out there. These are the types of things that are, are the potential positives that I've talked about for social media to be able to uh, do these types of things out there and elevate it from, from the mire that it can become if we just stand aside and let it. And of course, and obviously as the communication tool, getting information like this out there to people, uh, it, it's, it is making your platform relevant. It is, is sharing information and it does have a relationship to the critics because on their pages, if it's almost all negative and on your pages, even if there is some negativity there, if they're seeing 
even this is not going to be maybe make anybody feel good, but it's useful information. It's making your site a an information site that they will use and uh, it will benefit you down the road. Now let's talk a little bit about, about negative email threads because I know many principals have uh, email distribution lists uh, for all of their parents, for, for teachers, for everybody in the building out there. Um, when you see a problem that's being spread via email, ask yourself, does it really require a reaction? It's kind of like when I talk to people about working with the news media and years ago when I went to work for KSBA, uh, and, I, and I use this in classes when I'm talking about getting a correction in the news media. When I got hired by KSBA, a newspaper in Western Kentucky, for some reason, did a story about it and mentioned that I had been hired as the executive director of the Kentucky School Boards Association. It wasn't my title, but I didn't ask for a correction. I had someone send me a copy of the paper and I said to my dad, look at my new job. But uh, you get to decide if there needs to be a reaction. Second thing is, does it need to be a point-to-point -point response to that person, or does it need to be a shared response? Maybe that person has, has criticized something or even just raised a question that you can clarify with that individual without going to everybody else. But again, if that person's question is creating some buzz, or if you think that there is some greater good to make certain that other people don't have this same information, then you may want to, in one of the rare exceptions of reply all, I hate reply all. I would like to meet the person who came up with the concept for reply all and really have a face-to-face -face discussion with that person. But there are rare occasions when reply all may be something that can be used to your benefit. Then decide, do you need to do it electronically or does it need to be in person? Sometimes there are criticisms misinformation statements that are made that uh you know going back and forth over a period of hours is really not going to help anybody you really need to have this conversation person to person so make that decision as you go before you decide on whether you're going to put something out you don't we all get too many emails i retired and i get too many emails i can't imagine what you all are dealing with but uh you don't want to have seven or eight uh email things going on when you might be able to deal with it by just having an in-person conversation with that individual. Sometimes though, especially when there are criticisms, when there are other problematic issues, you may need to involve somebody else. This may need to be your supervisor, uh, could be uh, the DPP, uh, could be uh, somebody else in HR, might be the superintendent. You know, I, I preach this concept of watching the back door, and I would suggest to any principal out there that if you are seeing a building problem going on, uh, whether it's with an individual or with a group of individuals, uh, consider letting the superintendent know. Watching the back door just means that they don't get surprised about hearing about the issue that they maybe should have heard from you. So the consideration is that maybe you want to involve somebody else. And if you are dealing with a critic, and this would be whether it's on social media or whether this would be via email, if you're dealing with a critic out there and has been become problematic, uh, keep that communications trail. You may want to print it out if you don't have daily backups on your computer, but you want to have that so you're not, so if someone else says, well, she said this, you've got proof. Well, that's what was said, and here is how I responded. I hate that it comes that way, but there are critics out there that because you are responsive and maybe because you responded better than they stated their objection, that they want to lash out by using this your communication against you. So keep that communications trail out there as you're going forward. And the last thing is, it's very simple. You've heard it in other forums and other things, but before you reply to a critic, take a breath, pause, exhale, and decide, do I really want to post this? Do I really want to send this email? Take a look at what you've written. Uh, I, I, I have learned the hard way that there are some times that how I initially phrase something, and you know, I, I've learned you don't start off 
you gravy sucking pig and then make my point uh, no matter how infuriated I am. But sometimes you may want to change a word. Sometimes you may want to take out a sentence. Sometimes you may decide not to send it at all. Sometimes it's just good to write it and not even send it. But, uh, or maybe you'll have somebody else look at it. I am very fortunate. I am married. I'm a journalist by trade. I'm married to a journalist. She's a former Associated Press writer, now a magazine editor. Uh, if, if I'm having to send something out that's I'm not critical that much, uh, but, but it's controversial. I may have her take a look at it, see if she understands what I'm saying and what I uh, wanted, wanted to communicate. And if she says, you know, I really wouldn't send that, uh, I, I am at least going to go back and rephrase it if I don't send it. But take that breath. Think before you post. Think before you send it out. And uh, even, if you, even if you've written it, don't send it out you're less likely to feel bad than if you send it out and something comes up and, gee, I wish I hadn't sent. I mean, how many people have hit the send button and said, oh, I wish I hadn't done that? So questions. Let's see if we have any. I've tried to build in enough time to allow for that opportunity. I'm going to stop sharing and get myself up here. And let's see, uh, Christy, first, do we have anything in the chat box? I do not see anything in the chat box, Brad. Okay, is there anybody that would just like to open up and come on camera and pose a question? Uh, I will say, Christy, like you did before, would you put my email address sure will. Uh, in the chat box? Uh, if you would like a copy of the PowerPoint, if you would simply email me and I will pop it right back. I've done several of them this morning, this afternoon. I'll pop the PowerPoint right back to you and you'll be able to have it. But, but, but seriously, if anybody has any questions at all, uh, I'm always a believer in there's no penalty in ending something early. And so if we don't have any questions, that's cool. Uh, but if anybody has anything you'd like to raise an example, something that you do in deciding about dealing with critics out there. I'm not bad about firing off emails if I'm upset, but I will say last year I was a high school principal and I was sitting at my keyboard typing something really just to get it out of my system. And my assistant principal came in and he said, I don't know who you're getting ready to send that to, but back away from the keyboard. <laughs> it was like, I'm not sending it. I'm just what I want to say. <laughs> but I always laughed back away from the keyboard. For all of my social media sessions, I didn't do it today because it's hard to be able to see it. I have a t-shirt and it says, keep calm and think before you post. Exactly. Well, I don't want to hold you all up any longer. Thank you very much for all the time you spent today. Thank you, Christy, for your help uh, doing this session. Thank you for what you do every day. And I hope if I've given you one idea today, uh, it's been uh, worth my time. And I hope it has been for other folks, too. And thank you very much for what you do in your time. I'm available to help it. I do training for school districts and leadership personnel. So if I can be of assistance at any point in time, thanks a lot. And, Christy, thank you again. Thank you. Enjoyed it very much.